Hello everyone. Uh, um, first, let me introduce myself. I'm Rasha Negm. I'm the head of fintech and innovation at the Central Bank of Egypt. And uh, as much as I would have loved to do this presentation face to face with you guys, uh, unfortunately, I had to record it because we all have to stay uh, safe at home. So I'll try to be as quick and in and interactive uh, as much as I can, though I'm the only one uh, speaking in here. And uh, please do have a pen and paper and write down your questions, and we'll be uh, happy to answer them uh, via, uh, by email later on. Uh, so why am I uh, why am I why 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 am I here uh, uh, doing this? This is because I know that you've been asked to do a fintech uh, presentation within your course, or sorry, a fintech uh, project within your course, and uh, I just want to take you through uh, uh, the innovation and the fintech uh, side of things when it comes to Egypt and when it comes to the efforts and the role of the Central uh, central Bank of Egypt. So before I start, uh, I just want to ask you um, a question. What do you think is the common uh, thing between uh, those two videos or two pictures? Did you get it? I think most of you uh, have got it Be uh, because the two the one common thing between those two pictures or videos are actually they both don't exist anymore. Do you know why they don't exist anymore? Yes, because they couldn't survive, they couldn't adapt. And it's not the strongest of the speeches like the dinosaurs or the most intelligent like when the Nokia introduced their, their first mobile phones that actually survived in the market. Those who survive are those who are responsive to change. So what do we mean by responsive to change? Is actually to adapt to the new dynamics and technologies and things happening around us, around us in the market. And, uh, and this is where the digital disruption happens. So digital has disrupted a lot of industries, including the financial services. How did they do that? Let me give you like a bit of example that you've all known. For example, the media entertainment. Me, as an old person, and I know that you cannot see me, but I am, I used to go to the video shops and rent those videotapes like you're seeing to, to watch a movie. Now nobody's doing this anymore. Those old shops have closed because everyone is now doing Netflix, right? Not only this in transportation. No one is like using taxis anymore. Everyone is like, doing, uh, is like using Uber and Kareem. That, that they've been classified like the world's largest taxi companies without even owning a single taxi. The disruption happened in the hospitality business, where Airbnb has disrupted the hotel industries at large. Retail, Amazon, has disrupted all the shopping stores with online shopping. And finance is no different. In financial services, worldwide, nobody's using cash anymore. They're just as easy as tapping their either phone or Apple Watch to, to pay and go, to, to have their services. And remember when, uh, uh, I think, uh, if you open the account or your parents opened an account, like you spend a lot of time going to the bank with the long queues trying to open a bank account. Some of the people took like the day of just for them to go and do a banking service. Now opening an account is very easy and very fast. Let me show you how. Yes, it's as easy and fast as popping your popcorn at home. So, why why all these digital disruptions happened and 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 disrupted a lot of businesses because now people are looking at the value they're taking out of those solutions and services it's not about it's not a, no longer about the value chain or who's giving the solution i don't have to go to a bank to take my financial solution i don't have to take a taxi per se to have to, uh, to have my ride it's about the value that i'm taking and there are three important values we have to take into consideration. One, the cost value. People want to pay less. 
if it's cheaper for me, then I would like the service and I will, I will use the service. Not only for the lowering cost, it can be like as transparent as possible. Like I'm pay I know what I'm paying for. It's price transparent. Or I'm just paying for whatever I'm consuming. I don't have to pay for everything just to take a very small portion of the service that I'm getting. The second most important value is the experience. Consumer experience is very, very crucial when it comes to uh, a fintech and digital and digital solution at large. It's the ease of using the application. It's like tailoring the application to suit my needs and my understanding and, and, conven and, and make it convenient for me. Experience is a, it's, it's a very crucial value to, to be taken into consideration. And lastly, the third one is the platform value. What do you mean by the platform value? I, when I want to get uh, into an app, I don't want to uh, go, go bet between apps just to make one service happen or just to take all my services. I want to use my app to do everything that I need to do. Like, for example, Amazon. Amazon is doing a lot of things for its customers just for them not to go to a different website or a different app. Amazon is doing the online shopping, delivering the product to your door. They e you can even buy on credit. They're giving loans. They just disrupted like a five whole industries together just to make the consumer not leaving their app. So digital marketplaces or doing a lot of things in one super or killer app is actually can be one of the value proposition. So take into account that it's not about who is giving the service. It's about the value that this solution is giving to the customers. And you'll find out that the adoption is going to be very fast. When people got the value that, you, that you're selling, they're automatically going to convert into an active customer. For example, you know that the normal phone that we all have at home, like the landline, you know that for reaching 50 million users, the normal phones took them 75 years, while for Facebook to get the 50 million users only took them two years. Instagram took them 19 months and Pokemon took 19 days. This is how fast people can actually adopt innovation. When it comes to fintech and financial technology, we have to rethink finance in this way. So what is fintech? Fintech is basically, very simply, the innovative use of technology in the design and the delivery of any financial service. So what does that mean? It's like if it's a simple innovative idea that it happened to have a technology or a digital mean of its delivery of design, then actually you're doing a fintech. And why would it, was it very important for us to endorse fintech, especially from a central bank perspective and doing it on a national strategy level? Well, let's talk about Egypt a bit. Egypt, with a total population of 100 million, we are 100 million living in Egypt. It's the majority of the population are actually youth. Do you know that more than 51% are between the age of 15, 16 to 39? So basically, we need to find solutions that is actually suitable for those kind of youth segments. And do you know out of the 100 million user uh, uh, population, only 33% are financially included? Just 33 million? But what is financial inclusion for you who don't know? Financial inclusion is basically like uh, where any individual or business that can have an access to a useful or affordable financial product or service that actually meets their own needs. This is when what we call financial inclusion. It has to uh, ha it has to tackle a need and making the life better of the, of, the, of the individual or the business to have a financial need. This is what financial inclusion means. Can you imagine that only 33% of the population having this? So if you guys, I know that you can have like cards, most of you can have cards. If you have a card in your hand now, that you are part of the 33%.
So the rest that are excluded or financially excluded, we needed to have more solution or digital solution for them to, to have a financial need, especially that, do you know that almost 100% of the population, it's just 93% or more, 94% of the population are already uh, mobile subscribed. They all have a mobile. Almost everyone in the population has a mobile phone. And you know that 50% of them are actually having smartphones with internet usage. So this has give us room when it comes to the financial services to have more people included just by using their phone. And this is where fintech step in. We need to have innovative solutions for people to have financial means or financial tools or access based on tackling their own needs as, as simply as put them on their on their phone. And of course, when it comes to the ventures or the companies, amazingly that 99% of our ventures are actually MSMEs, which is the micro and small and medium enterprise. Actually, 97% of uh, the enterprises are microfinance. And this, and this where all the small businesses needs to have innovative uh, financial uh, or fintech uh, solutions as well. And this is why we're focusing on Egypt on having uh, fintech. So all those factors has contributed to the Central Bank of Egypt to have their own fintech and innovation strategy nationally with the vision to become a globally recognized fintech hub in Arab and the Africa uh, world and to be the home to next generation financial services, talent and innovative development. This is our positioning and this is where we aspire to, to be. Actually, we aspire to be the flagship or to endorse financial inclusion, SME financing, like we're saying, the micro and small and medium enterprise financing and cross-border payments when it comes to fintech. And why we're saying cross-border payments? Because you know that Egypt has a very, as it, it, it has one of the largest uh, remittance inwards uh, uh, worldwide. Actually, last year, uh, we've just uh, realized uh, 28 billion US dollars uh, when it comes to the inward remittance. And this is because we have a lot of Egyptians working out, um, uh, outside Egypt that are actually remitting money uh, to, to, to their families back home. And this is where we need to find new innovative ways to cater for all the families here uh, trying to receive uh, their monthly income and uh, from, um, from their family members working outside Egypt. So basically having the position and the, the aspiration of the Central uh, Bank of Egypt, uh, uh, let us focus on what can we do in terms of fintech and innovation in serving uh, uh, the financial needs of the customer, especially the unbanked and un, uh, underserved uh, segments in the society, while how can we actually endorse in, in technology and endorse our startups and entrepreneurs to come up with the solutions and uh, to come up for the solutions and services uh helping the financial institutions and banks to come up with a better innovative ideas that caters for all the segments especially youth and the unbanked and underserved do you know what is the benefit and why we want to do it what are the benefits of turning people to use less cash or becoming a less cash society or having fintech and uh, uh, means or solutions in the market so first, let's take uh, what it's in it for you or what's in it for us as normal consumers. One, it's actually providing me more safety by reducing the risk of theft. Of course, I don't, I don't carry cash in, in, in my pocket, which means that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm less than, I, I have less tendency to get robbed. Um, um, and this is and this is one of the big benefits of of, of fintech, you know, or electronic payments at large. The second thing is, 
I can actually have affordable financial products, like you're saying, because it's actually very convenient for me to spend less money. Like, for example, if I want to go to, uh, I, if I want to, um, uh, to go uh, recharge, uh, to go to pay, to pay for any of my bills or recharge my, my internet bundle or whatever. Is it more convenient for me uh, and more and less costly for me to do it at home or just to uh, um, get down the street, take a taxi or an Uber or park my car where I have to pay the, uh, um, the monedi or whatever and, and do the transaction of course, when sitting at home, doing it on my mobile, whether paying for my bill or recharging my internet or whatever, is by far much convenient and much more cost effective for me to, to, to even at least going uh, with either a transportation or parking my car or doing uh, whatever. Not only this, but I can, I can actually trace my transaction. I can actually manage uh, my expenses if if my all my transactions happening on all my payments are happening digitally uh, if I can manage all my monthly allowance or whatever it is digitally it can help me like trace my transactions and manage them effectively to even uh, save maybe uh, um, try to uh, who, <laughs> try to, to try to uh, to even have my my allowance till end of month because I've been there and you guys how many of you like actually uh, uh, just spend their whole monthly allowance at the beginning of the month and then the rest of the month they're just like trying to figure it out how I'm going to have more cash from from my parents like or or how much uh, uh, or how much I have to um, uh, to to pay for my expenses for the rest of the month since I didn't track or I didn't manage all my finance. This is how how important it is for me as a consumer to have a fintech or to have an electronic mean or any uh, financial technology solution. But on the economy side, and this is where all uh, we have to focus as a regulator, uh, it, it serves a lot of purposes. Number one, the reduce of cash handling costs. Handling cost is huge for us. So this is like an increase in handling cost. We, of course, serve the underserved and underbanked for a better um, economical development. And not only this, do you know that it's actually curbing inflation? And how is that? For example, if you're taking a taxi and paying in cash, and actually al adbed of the meter has, has given you like you have to pay 12 Egyptian pounds. How much actually are you going to give the taxi driver? Exactly, you're going to give them like 15. Are you going to take the change back? Of course not. You're going just to leave the 15. And this is where the inflation happens because you're actually paying more than uh, more than the actually this uh, the price of the service. And not only this, when you actually uh, go into a kiosk at the street and you you took whatever you took like a um, uh, gums, for example, and it costs you like three pounds. So you're going to give the five pounds or you're even going to take something with the rest of the two pounds or you're going even to leave it all together. And this is where the inflation actually happens. And then when you pay digital, when you pay Uber with your card and, it, and the meter says it's 12, then you're only going to pay 12. You're not going to pay the 15. And this is where we curb the inflation. Not only this, Fintech helps the economy in increasing job opportunities. Do you know that one job in fintech it induces more it induces 5.6 jobs? And do you know that every 10% increase in electronic payment actually it contributes to more of 200,000 employment opportunity? And of course, it has a reflection on the GDP, as the slide says, but it actually increased job opportunity, but not like the typical job that we all know of. It's like the new job that you guys are actually uh, are going to have as a skill set. It's like why you're taking now entrepreneurship and innovation into your curriculum, because we need this new type of skill set 
that is going to make the employment of the future. Okay, so what are the fintech giants? And this is where actually uh, things are going to get more exciting because you're actually going to, uh, it, it will uh, drive us more into talk about your project. Uh, fintech has a lot of trends. It's either um, uh, like the mobile payment that we're talking about, like mobile money. I'm having an account on my mobile. Like I can do uh, transfers. I can pay my bills. I can tap and go my mobile for for paying uh, for paying uh, uh, on the go, uh, grabbing my coffee. And it also has a lot of other trends. Like for example, uh, let's take for example the blockchain and um, I'm not sure whether uh, you all know about uh, the blockchain technology. Uh, the simple way of it, I don't want to complicate things for you who don't, who don't know blockchain. You can actually research it. But it's actually, it was like a, an, a creative uh, way of doing um, um, decentralization of, uh, uh, of ledger. Or for example, like... Um, you know when when you're doing the transaction it's actually gets stored in a central database the blockchain is like doing it on a public dat database where actually um you're just transferring digital information between trusted entities uh so you can uh, so you can actually um like having shared uh, uh information for doing the transactions faster and uh, cost-effective at, at most of the time, and this is where all the solutions uh, are. Uh, we're going to explain in a bit. Um, actually, uh, use the blockchain for. So what I want to say about it's not the underlying infrastructure technology that actually helps those solutions to thrive. It's about the need that actually the blockchain has helped them to get it. Like for example, the remittance, and we said that. We needed to help the families here uh, to get the remittance as fast as possible, as co as cost effective as possibly, uh, getting uh, getting it from the outside Egypt to inside uh, to inside. This this is one of the blockchain uh, uh, um, solution. Uh, the blockchain helped the solution to get it by uh, by getting it less costly by eliminating the third party because. Now, um, getting a correspondent banks and the information uh, flying uh, from different entities and the money transfer. Now you can do the money transfer instantly with no third party. So they eliminated the third party, which means la lower, lower cost and instant settlement of transaction, which is faster. So people can get the remittance instantly with a very ch in a very cheap way. Not only this, the remittance side of the businesses, which we call the trade finance, which is basically like uh, trading happen happening. Uh, and usually the simple example of it, uh, a lot of merchandise happens to, to sit for a longer time in, in, uh, in, in, in the MENA. Uh, uh, and um, uh, just because uh, the papers are not there. And, uh, and, and, and blockchain helps the trade finance getting it faster when it comes to documentations. So it's actually emanated like 45 days into hours uh, when it comes to uh, document sharing, contracting, and not only this, but it helps them for transparency because they can share all uh, the credentials uh, and the uh, um, and and the and and the verification from the customers and all the entity side. So basically, it eliminated a lot from the fraud and it made the verification happening uh, fastly. So they can actually people get their merchandise um, uh, as quickly as possible um, uh, in doing their business. Blockchain has helped also the eKYC. And what is eKYC? Quickly, it's the electronic. Um, it's the electronic know your customer, which means that when I go to the bank, I have to sign a document and I have to sign that I am the physical customer who's actually doing the service. And this is what we call it, know your customer. Blockchain actually as a technology help the EQIC, which is the electronic way of identifying customers, um, identifying customers. So people don't have to go to the bank for them to sign, uh, to sign for the, 
whatever the terms and conditions of having a new service or opening a bank account, uh, the electronic way of doing the KYC can actually be shared on a, blo a blockchain, so, so it can actually happen uh, seamlessly and faster uh, uh, between financial institutions, and people don't have to go to the banks anymore. There are a lot of services happen on the artificial intelligence side, and what does it mean? Like chatbots. Who, guy, who, who, who from you guys wants to, to go to the bank or call the call center for them to get to know um, a certain, uh, to, to know about a certain product or service inside the bank? Now the chatbots where you can actually chat with a customer service or what we call it like human-like consumer experience chatting where you can actually chat to know about the service, what, what, what products would you want, and not even have to go to the bank or even call the con call center. AI can also happen to be like, if you guys want to save money, how would you actually save the money? Some of them, some of you have actually thought of, uh, let's try some money in, into, the, into the bursa or whatever. Like, uh, let me try, uh, let me try a few, uh, few quids and see, um, right? So, and then it ended up either uh, you've relied on someone that actually um, uh, couldn't make you any money or you lost the money or actually can make, uh, the, uh, or can actually make you like a few quids out of the uh, bursa. But again, robo advisory and the AI can actually take a 30 years of market history analysis and actually do the forecast. So you can actually have an accuracy rate of 83% on what are the best investment portfolios or the investment that you can do when it comes to the stock market. So um, this is like a, a new way of doing investments uh, based on AI or robo-advisory. Not only this, behavioral scoring lending, and this is very interesting. Do you guys, whether you're in college or yet not yet employed, do you think that you can take a loan? Is anyone have you thought of taking a loan? Of course not, because what the bank is going to ask for a lot of documentation. They're going to ask you for an HR letter or proof of income. Uh, where do you work? And you don't have this. So how can I actually uh, take a loan or an emergency loan or an instant loan that is actually happening digitally and instant? This is where the behavioral scoring comes. Imagine that I'm taking all your behavioral uh, data and put it in an algorithm or in a scoring thing to get what what is what is the worth of you to get a loan? Like for example, how many uh, how many do you have a smartphone or a feature phone or just a normal phone? How much minutes do you consume per day? Uh, do you have internet on your mobile? Do you have an ADSL at home? And all those behaviors, how much you're spending, and all those behaviors can actually be calculated and put in algorithm where it can it can actually give you an emergency loan based on your behavioral expenditure and and habits rather than your normal way of giving an employment proof or an HR letter to the bank and getting a loan. This is where the digital or, or the digital has disrupted the whole lending industry and and uh, and the way of doing uh, lending. Okay, RegTech or uh, a security measures, and this is the nice thing about it. Uh, like, uh, and we're going to talk about the RegTech in in a bit which is the compliance way of doing things. Because a lot of people, they don't have like a trust when it comes to their mobile doing financial transactions. And this is where a lot of solutions or startups in the market uh, um, worldwide have done like a sort of uh, more security uh, measures for the people when doing uh, financials across uh, 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 using their, their mobile. Like for example, they can actually analyze the way that you're actually holding your phone uh, swiping, swiping your phone, typing letters, and taking this behavior. And once they spot that those behavior change, they actually cut the transaction down. So, uh, so actually protecting uh, your mobile um, uh, from any fraud uh, or or from any theft from your mobile, mobile doing a financial transaction. Not only this, it can actually uh, another another um, solutions happen to have extra layers of authentications if it when it comes to i want a 
separate fingerprint when it comes to my financial transaction or facial recognition, or even shutting down my credit cards when going outside Egypt, or when 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 or doing separate limits or minimized limits because I'm doing things on the mobile rather than the electronic payment. So those kind of uh, solutions actually help people to trust more uh, and um, to be more cautious when doing financial transaction over mobile over over mobile phone. Uh, with all those um, things happening and the digital disruption and us encouraging uh, the digital tr uh, the digital transformation and the digital economy and doing electronic transactions now even with things happening around the coronavirus and everybody uh, like um, uh, watching out using uh, money uh, or cash or 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 handling cash between each other and we have to have everything done remotely and everything and finance is no different the central bank of egypt has taken a lot of measures and a lot of exceptional um, regulations uh, to actually uh, endorsing cashless transaction for your own safety when it comes to the coronavirus. It started with you can even self-register your uh, uh, yourself on 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 a mobile money wallet with any of uh, the banks offering it. When you're at home, you don't have to to go any elsewhere to just sign the terms of conditions or opening uh, the mobile uh, money wallet. We've done all the transfer fees on the mobile money for free. We've done all the ATMs fees for free. We've increased the limits of the transaction when it comes to the mobile, the mobile money or the prepaid cards, increasing the limits from actually uh, 6,000 per day to 30,000 per day. And um, not only this, uh, we've, uh, we, we, we've even uh, endorsed the QR code at the merchant. Like now you can scan your mobile using a QR code uh, instead of paying in cash, uh, you know that uh, in the market we have prepaid contactless cards. And what what the, what does it mean, contactless card? And you can actually uh, get it for free from the banks now. Is like you can tap and go your service. You don't have even to enter your card into the POS and put your pen on the POS. So you can actually touch uh, touch the POS. You can actually like tap and go your the POS and get the service and we've increased its limits to 600 EGP. For example, you can go to the Starbucks, get your coffee and tap your card on the POS. You don't even have to either enter or put the pin or, or, or doing anything, just a tap and go uh, transaction. Not only this, for the people who are banked, you can actually register to your internet banking uh, with 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 just calling the call center of your bank or just visit the website, and this is how we wanted to make things easier for the people to be more safe, uh, less interactive, and uh, uh, lower queues, uh, not stepping outside the house, uh, preferably. And those are the things applicable for the next six months when it comes to the central bank of Egypt. And actually, this is the great project that you can actually endorse now because um, during this time and uh, and given the coronavirus and everything around us turning into uh, digital and, uh, and electronic, how can you come up actually with the best solution given this challenge? Because this, this project was about uh, introducing to you what we, we have in Egypt in terms of national problem statement, and I'm going to come to you with the national problem statement, but the most important national problem statement that we're having now is that actually, what can we do to endorse fintech solutions in helping people getting a safe and better services during the coronavirus? What can fintech solution can be? What fintech solution can be offered to help Egyptian citizens getting over the interaction happening from cash, from stepping into a certain place to do a financial transaction, be doing an electronic payments, getting an even a loan or whatever it is? How can a fintech solution can help us in the situation that we're having? And this can be 
uh, the basis of the project that you're actually, or the problem that you're going to solve within your project. So, uh, Egypt, uh, part of what we've done at the Central Bank of Egypt and with the whole fintech ecosystem uh, stakeholders, uh, we've came up with more than 80 national problem statements when it comes to the financial sector. Uh, why we're saying this? Because we're saying that when it comes to uh, you guys, the talent and the inno innovative people or the innovative youth of Egypt, uh, when, when we want you to come up with a solution, we don't want the bank or the financial institution or uh, that is taking the solution from you to come and tell you, we want a certain, we want an EKYC solution. Uh, we want a blockchain solution. It's not going to happen this way. We want them to come and tell you, we have this problem. What can you do for us as a solution to solve this problem? Because you guys are much more innovative in finding a solution for our problems rather than we figure out what we want to do and tell you to do it. So we came up with five categories of national problem statements. And I'll, I'll take you through them quickly and try to relate them on the, on, on the challenges that we're facing now during the coronavirus, uh, even those days. The five categories of the problem statements comes with customer engagement, how I'm going to engage customers more to do the FinTech or the financial solutions. Uh, financial literacy with all uh, the, uh, the the limited financial literacy in Egypt and the limit and and the it's a very minimal people that know know about the financial solutions how I'm going to educate more people to do financial or even digital financial services of course our two main uh, national problem uh, uh, problem statements are financial inclusion for medium and small and micro enterprises uh, financial inclusion uh, for consumers, and finally the rectal. So let's take the consumer engagement. And this is a problem that we can have either, even when we have the coronavirus. Like for example, the adults use conventional methods to pay their bills and financial obligation, and they don't find any incentive to use digital payment solution. So what can we do to increase their engagement? If I want to pay for, um, if I want to pay for my, uh, my bill, I'll go to, um, I'll either wait for a Rogel Bita uh, Kahraba to come and uh, knock on my door to, to, to take the reading and the Yahud al Fulus menu of the monthly bill, or I can do it digitally from my home without any interaction, uh, especially that we don't need more interaction. Uh, or I want to pay, I, I want to pay for my, uh, for, 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 for a financial obligation that I have, so I have to step out the house step outside the house so I can actually either pay for my loan or doing a certain collection that it's required for me financially. How can I entice people or increase their engagement doing it digitally uh, rather than go to the place and pay it in cash or uh, stepping outside stepping outside my, uh, my home? And believe me, I know the incentive is quite big now because uh, pe people now, they don't want to have any interactions. But how can I engage them enough to do this financial, uh, uh, digital financial transaction? Like, for example, when the central bank thought of something, we've just eliminated all the fees because we want to entice more people to do the transaction and engage them, engage them to do it. You can think of more innovative ideas on in how to create a consumer engagement, from loyalty, from any kind of different... Uh, 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 innovative solution you can think of. Financial literacy. And this is where, unfortunately, all the low-income customers or the unbanked have lack of knowledge of digital and financial uh, education, of course. So how can we educate them on the importance of using digital financial services? How can I actually tap into those segments with, a ver with, with their language, with the way of they un understanding things and help them do a digital financial service, especially on those times when we actually uh, try to endorse the, 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 the knowledge of less cash means more safety for you. Electronic payments mean more safe, means more safety for you. This is what we need more solutions on how to do the financial literacy. Financial inclusion 
uh, when it comes to uh, consumer, uh, consumer or individual uh, facing problems, like for example, an unbanked customer trying to collect the gamaya. Everyone in Egypt, especially the bottom of the pyramids, are doing gamaya, and they all like tend to um, uh, collect the money. Oh, and I have to go and pay it to whomever is taking the gamaya from everyone. So how can I do a digital way as as simple of guys, you don't have to go and transfer uh, to give the money to the the doorstep of the person who's actually uh, managing the gamaya so he can actually take all this money and give it to the person how can I actually digitize all this gamaya cycle? Uh, uh, especially in 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 those uh, times, this is like an, a simple a simple a simple problem that needs a fintech solution. Not only this, financial inclusion for micro and small and medium enterprises, like a small size company that used to pay their payroll. And I'm trying to uh, and I'm always paying my pair my people like a restaurant. I'm always paying my people uh, uh, in cash. So uh, now with everything, with the delivery, with everything that everyone is staying home, with all the curfews happening and whatever, how can I actually have an automated way of paying people my salary? What if there are not even as, uh, like, there are like, um, uh, like the people who's doing the, the, the deliveries, or what if in the home of Shaimala Mu'akkata, they're not like my permanent pay on my on my permanent payroll. So how can I do an automated tool to actually pay or to, to do the payroll services to my employees rather than giving them in cash? This is a very this is a very uh, 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 cha- uh, very common challenge now with, with even now with the coronavirus that a lot of people need a fintech solution for. And finally, the rec tech, and this is when it comes with, we call it the regulatory technology or the regulatory technology, where how can we improve financial services uh, and banks to um, serve their clients? Like the EKYC is part of the rec tech. So the problem here, uh, like we're giving an example of the problem, is that the financial institutions seek to improve their customer satisfaction without their physical attendance, like we're facing now. We don't want people to step into the branches. We know that even uh, so, how can so how can we facilitate the use of automation for financial advisors to assess consumer needs and satisfaction level uh, based on standardized questionnaire and how to take their queries on uh, and how to serve them better without their physical attendance at the branch. So those are like an examples of the challenges that we actually face now, uh, in ter- uh, face now, or in general in Egypt, if you want to endorse a fintech uh, solution. But before we think of the solution, we have to think of the fintech ecosystem we're working on here. And what is the fintech ecosystem? The fintech ecosystem, which means that me as a solution, I don't work as a standalone. Like for example, if I'm a startup and I have the best solution ever, I might have I might have the solution and the brain, but I don't have the investments to, 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 uh, uh, to have my own startup. And this is where I need the investor. And not only this, I, mu- I want to sell my services to the financial institution and the banks. So those are needed as well in my ecosystem. Maybe I have all what it takes to have the solution uh, and I know how can I come up with the best solution and coding. But I don't know about management. I need an accelerator to take me through how can I take my idea and point uh, and proof of concept to, to be a, to have a successful startup. And this is where the role of incubators and accelerators in the, in, in the ecosystem uh, come. And not only this, I need the regulator because I need uh, to have my fintech solutions uh, licensed and I need to be regulated and I need the legal people to make sure that everything is uh, legalized when it comes to my solution. And this is where we can all call it the fintech ecosystem. Any solution, they don't thrive on its own. And any any startup, they don't, they don't start up actually without having the complete ecosystem that the central bank of Egypt and, I, and, and the regulators 
that is looking after the fintech try to actually endorse and trying to push the ecosystem further to have a bigger fintech ecosystem that's not only serving Egypt, but in, outside Egypt to the Arab and Africa world. So when you come to think of your solution and uh, being an entrepreneur, trying to, to, kick, to, to kick off your, uh, your startup, you need to think of all the ecosystem stakeholders to know how you're going to complement your offering. And not only this, I just want to give you a quick guidelines on how successful solutions work. First, like we've said, and most importantly, is you have to think of the customer at the center of your solution. It has to be customer-centric solution and very simple for your target audience or segment to use. You always have to think of your solution in terms of sizing because it has to be scalable. Otherwise, your solution is not going to be successful in the future. I don't, uh, looking at the target segment, for example, you don't think of a very small size of the population or very limited segment and try to, to sell your solution for it. Because eventually, you're not going to find any uh, customers using your, your, your product or your service. So it has to be scalable. And what, do, and what, what we mean about, uh, by legacy-free and asset and compliance-like is when you think of a solution, don't try to put it above a legacy that it has to be there. You don't have to wait for a certain big technology to happen or infrastructure technology to happen for you to do it. You don't have to uh, uh, wait for a, a major regulation to, to get released uh, from the regulators just to make it happen. Your service or solution has to be compliance-like. You don't have to wait for any regulation. You don't have to wait for a certain legacy to happen for you to have your product or services running. It has to be an asset and compliance like. The nice thing about the startups and why they actually innovate and, uh, and they're very agile, and this is why the financial, solution, uh, the financial institutions or the banks uh, 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 cooperate with startups because their legacy, their asset light. They don't need the big bureaucracy and legacy systems that the banks uh, have for them to get uh, their solution uh, up and running. And, and this is how you, how you have to think about your solution. And of course, it has to be innovative. Without innovation, then this is, this is, this is not the right uh, solution that if it's a me too or it's there, then most probably it's not going to succeed. And again, I know when you do the project or, you're, uh, and, or, or think of the solution, especially now that it's tackling a challenge happening, even to overcome uh, this coronavirus uh, uh, challenges that we're having, you have to assess the local market to know what are the exact needs. And you have to look at the global best practice of th whether this solution actually helped others uh, overcome this uh, challenge or not. And try to think of the value or the unique selling proposition that you're trying to offer to your customers. You have to have a gap you can actually want to bridge or to solve for you to have your, your own unique USP. And then you can formulate your go-to-market in terms of mission, vision, and objectives with target segmentation and propositions along with the market plan. And of course, you have to think of the needed resources uh, that, uh, that is required for you to, uh, to, to have your solution um, launch like for example what kind of capital it's required uh what kind of stakeholders uh from the ecosystem i uh, i i i need to partner with what are my kpis do i need financial uh, do i need what human resources even needed not only the financial uh, resources so um when you think about all of this this is how you can actually come up with uh, uh, a successful uh, so solution that uh, that you can actually uh, pitch for in, uh, pitch for uh, solving a certain uh, challenge. And finally, and I, uh, I hope I've, 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 I wasn't like too long for you. I know, we know that always big things happen from small beginnings, and you are the future, and you are the talent, and you are the entrepreneurs of the futures in Egypt. And 
a lot of great things happens with such a very simple, innovative solution that you can guys come up with. Like Google's have done it during the university time when they've been in University of Stanford or Facebook have done it uh, uh, in, in Harvard. Swavel here, uh, they've done it in Egypt and they're actually um, um, grown uh, like we've seen since 2017. You can be the next big thing happening uh, in the market. So I would like to thank you and I would like to say that you guys are the change to be the change and hopefully that uh, you've read down all your questions if you have any and we're happy to take them uh, by email and hopefully to see you soon after all those challenging time of the coronavirus goes away and see you later. Bye.